You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Many people believe public relations is press agentry, flackery, publicity. Public relations is not that. It is a two-way street advising the client on attitudes and actions to win over the public on whom viability of the unit depends, and then educating, informing, and persuading the public to accept these social goods, ideas, concepts, or whatever. Welcome to episode 33 of the Corbett Report. Meet Edward Bernays. What you have just been listening to is in fact an audio recording of Edward Bernays, a man who you have likely never heard of. There's no reason to feel ashamed of that. In fact, very few people probably know of Mr. Edward Bernays, although his influence on the 20th century cannot be underestimated, and his ideas still persist with us today in the 21st century. The fact that he's little known is rather ironic, considering this, the opening lines of one of his most famous works, from Chapter 1, called Organizing Chaos. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. As I say, those are the opening words to Edward Bernays' most famous writings, a 1928 book called Propaganda. Yes, this is the man who literally wrote the book on propaganda, whose ideas influenced millions, and whose brilliant brainwashing propaganda techniques inspired the likes of Joseph Goebbels in Nazi Germany. You have likely never heard of Edward Bernays, as I say, but you have heard of his uncle, Sigmund Freud. The interesting thing is that Edward Bernays was the man who made Sigmund Freud a household name in the United States. To get an idea of how Sigmund Freud's American nephew popularized his ideas and invented the art of public relations, or mass brainwashing propaganda... Let's take a listen to a whitewash documentary from NPR. This short audio examination of Edward Bernays' work gives us an idea of just how influential Edward Bernays has been. This story of Sigmund Freud begins at the Florida Avenue Grill in Washington, D.C. Now, it might seem a little strange to start a story about the father of psychoanalysis in a soul food restaurant. But it turns out that if you look closely, there's a trace of Freud's influence even here. I'm going to have bacon and eggs, cheese and eggs. Bacon and eggs, the all-American breakfast, is the most popular dish at the grill. According to waitress Catherine Leach, no other meal even comes close. About 60%, I will say. Mm-hmm. I ordered bacon, and bacon and eggs. But bacon and eggs wasn't always America's first choice for breakfast. The idea that this was the best way to start your day, like so many other things in American life, was actually systematically engineered by a public relations agent. In this case, a public relations agent who was greatly influenced by, and intimately connected to, Sigmund Freud, his nephew, Edward Bernays. Bernays grew up in America, but spent each summer walking the hills of Austria with his famous uncle. And during those outings, he absorbed many lessons about the inner workings of human psychology, including, says Stuart Ewan, history professor at Hunter College, the conviction that one of Western civilization's most basic assumptions about human nature was deeply flawed. Up until the early 1900s, one of the sort of fundamental assumptions was this kind of enlightenment idea that people are rational beings and that if you present a well-orchestrated case, you can persuade people. That's the basic logic of the Declaration of Independence. Freud, however, had a different vision of the human animal. He believed that people weren't rational at all, despite their apparently civilized exterior. Underneath it is this sort of turmoil of instincts and of unconscious desires and 
those kinds of things, although repressed, still exert an enormous power over the way people act. Sex, aggression, security, self-preservation. When Freud looked out at the world, he saw these drives motivating even the most ordinary activities. A concept, says Anne Bernays, daughter of Edward, grandniece of Freud, her father quickly absorbed. He ingested it early and just used it. That is, if you want to make somebody do what you want them to, you don't hook into what they say they want. You try to find out what they really want. Which brings us back to breakfast, to the mid 1920s, when, as a young publicist, Bernays was asked by the Beechnut Packing Company to improve sales of its primary product. Bacon. Author Larry Tai has written a book on Bernays called "The Father of Spin." He was basically hired by them to help restore sales that had sagged in a country that was on the run and was trimming its morning meal to juice, toast, and coffee. Now, the average PR guy back then would have told them, "Oh, put your bacon on sale, and that's a way to sell more of it. Or go out and advertise, take out expensive ads in newspapers." But Bernays clearly wasn't your average PR guy. Taking his cue from Freud, Bernays constructed a campaign intended to speak to a value much more basic than thrift: physical security. Food is about more than something just to nourish you. It's something to create a sense of well-being about what you're putting into your body. To connect bacon and well-being, Bernays distributed a survey to doctors. He asked one simple question: Do you support a hearty breakfast or a light one? The doctors responded that hearty was best, so Bernays came up with his own definition of hearty: bacon and eggs. With the weight of medical authority behind him, he then initiated an educational campaign, and the all-American breakfast was born. Before Eddie Bernays, we never thought of bacon and eggs as the all-American breakfast. So he was not just redefining a particular product; he was redefining the whole way America thought about the way they ate breakfast. In a way that persists today. Of course, Freud's insight into unconscious motivations had a profound impact in a variety of intellectual arenas. In mental health, generations of Americans became archaeologists of the mind. The concept also influenced economic thought and supplied countless graduate students in English with thesis material. But the way this idea transformed public relations is a lesson in unintended consequences. Prior to Freud and his nephew, publicity was all about emulating journalism. But after Freud and Bernays, the goal shifted from rational appeals to the stimulation of visceral impulse. Bernays wrote extensively about precisely how to apply Freud's complex theories, and his techniques were broadly adopted, used to sell everything from soap to presidents, cigarettes to foreign policy, and possibly even genocide. A reporter from UPI once came back after a visit with Adolf Hitler's PR chief Joseph Goebbels and told Eddie Bernays that in Goebbels' library, where they were doing the interview, one or two of Eddie Bernays' books were on those shelves, and it was clear that propaganda people, for better or for worse, used his theories and his ideas all around the world. Although Freud and Bernays corresponded regularly until Freud's death in 1939, apparently Freud never had a very clear understanding of how his ideas were being applied, and often recoiled when his nephew proposed some new plan to popularize his work. Eddie Bernays was perpetually suggesting to Sigmund Freud in these letters ways of commercializing his complex psychodynamic theories. He offered at one point. To help Sigmund Freud make a whole lot of money, if he could sort of put him into quick ditties that housewives and that busy people could sort of remember these take-home messages. Freud quickly declined Bernays's offer. His biographer Larry Tai. Freud saw this as consummately American, and just vulgar, and that's probably the way he would have seen if he had understood all the real ramifications of public relations and the way the career developed. I think Freud would have been shocked and outraged by a lot of what happened, but he also would have thought that was America and that was his nephew. Although Bernays was tremendously proud of his work, in time he too found himself disturbed by how his ideas and techniques were employed by people with whom he disagreed. And Bernays, he thought it was going to be used well. This kind of、uh, manipulative power, he thought or hoped that it was going to be used only for the good of everybody, which I think is unrealistic.
Today, focus groups and opinion polls are used throughout the world to mine the subterranean desires of the consumer. Marketers use MRI machines to peer inside the brain. There are instruments that track eye movements, pulse, skin temperature, all in an effort to better understand emotional response. And despite the fact that we live in the so-called information age, much of the material that bombards us, that tells us what to eat, who to vote for, what to wear, how to feel about war, is not, says Professor Ewan, intended to appeal to our minds. It's not that the public is incapable of thought. It's that the kind of material that's being shoveled in our direction is designed to bypass thought. And for that we can thank, at least in part, Sigmund Freud. For NPR News, I'm Elise Spiegel in Washington. As I say, despite the fact that that audio excerpt has some interesting information about Bernays, it ultimately amounts to little more than a whitewash. I think that's evident from the way that his daughter, Anne Bernays, attempts to spin his legacy. Let's listen again to the comments that Anne Bernays makes about her father, someone who I think we could agree has a vested interest in maintaining his reputation. He thought it was going to be used well, this kind of uh, manipulative power. He thought or hoped that it was going to be used only for the good of everybody, which I think is unrealistic. Now that makes Edward Bernays sound like an eminently reasonable character. Yes, I mean, he was a bit idealistic, a bit of a starry-eyed dreamer who believed that these brainwashing techniques could only be used for good, but, well, unfortunately they were used by people with nefarious purposes, something that Edward Bernays obviously had no control over, and thus he could not be blamed for any bad effects of this propaganda. Of course, that's a load of bunkum and can be instantly disproven by taking a look at some public relations campaigns that Edward Bernays was involved in, other than the bacon and eggs campaign, which of course sounds pretty harmless. What campaigns am I talking about? Well, for an example, let's turn to this excellent documentary entitled The Century of the Self. This documentary is widely available online, and I heartily suggest that my listeners check out at least the first part of this three-part documentary, entitled Happiness Machines. This is an excellent look at how the worlds of psychoanalysis, politics, propaganda, and advertising all interconnected in the early part of the 20th century to produce some of the mass manipulation techniques which we now take for granted as part of our daily existence. It's important to examine this history, though, to see where a lot of these techniques come from. And still, I think, if someone accused a company in this day and age of employing some of the very techniques which Edward Bernays was affecting almost a century ago, they would probably be touted as conspiracy theorists or paranoid delusionals. So, in order to dispel that myth, let's take a listen to a section of Happiness Machines from the Century of the Self documentary, in order to get a sense not only of how psychoanalysis has been employed in the art of propaganda, but also as to how evil and manipulative Edward Bernays himself was, and how uncaring he was about the ends of his propaganda. Let's take a listen to this. Bernays set out to experiment with the minds of the popular classes. His most dramatic experiment was to persuade women to smoke. At that time, there was a taboo against women smoking, and one of his early clients, George Hill, the president of the American Tobacco Corporation, asked Bernays to find a way of breaking it. He said, we're losing half of our market because men have invoked the taboo against women smoking in public. Can you do anything about that? I said, let me think about it. And then I said, have I your permission to see a psychoanalyst to find out what cigarettes mean to women? He said, what'll it cost? So I called up Dr. Brill, A.A. Brill, who was a leading psychoanalyst in New York at that time. How come you didn't call your uncle? Why didn't you call your uncle? Because he was in Vienna. A.A. Brill was one of the first psychoanalysts in America. And for a large fee, he told Bernays that cigarettes were a symbol of the penis and of male sexual power. He told Bernays that if he could find a way to connect cigarettes with the idea of challenging male power, then women would smoke, because then they would have their own penises. 
Every year, New York held an Easter Day parade to which thousands came. And Bernays decided to stage an event there. He persuaded a group of rich debutantes to hide cigarettes under their clothes. Then, they should join the parade, and at a given signal from him, they were to light up the cigarettes dramatically. Bernays then informed the press that he had heard that a group of suffragettes were preparing to protest by lighting up what they called torches of freedom. He knew this would be an outcry, and he knew that all of the photographers would be there to capture this moment. And so he was ready with a phrase, which was torches of freedom. And so here you have a symbol, women, young women, debutantes, smoking a cigarette in public with a phrase that means anybody who believes in this kind of equality pretty much has to support them in the ensuing debate about this, because torches of freedom. I mean, what's on all American coins? It's liberty. She's holding up the torch, you see? And so all of this is there together. There's emotion, there's memory, there's a rational phrase. Even though it's using a lot of emotional elements, it's a, it's a phrase that works in a rational sense. Uh, all of this is together. And so the next day, this was not just in all of the New York, papers, it was across the United States and around the world. And from that point forward, uh, the sale of cigarettes to women began to rise. He had made them socially acceptable with a single symbolic act. What Bernays had created was the idea that if a woman smoked, it made her more powerful and independent. An idea that still persists today. Embrace me my sweet embrace. It made him realize that it was possible to persuade people to behave irrationally if you link products to their emotional desires and feelings. The idea that smoking actually made women freer was completely irrational, but it made them feel more independent. It meant that irrelevant objects could become powerful emotional symbols of how you wanted to be seen by others. Eddie Bernays saw the way to sell product was not to sell it to your intellect that you ought to buy an automobile, but that you will feel better about it if you have this automobile. I think he originated that idea that they weren't just purchasing something, but they were engaging themselves emotionally or personally in, in, in the product or service. That it's not you, you think you need a new piece of clothing but you'll feel better with the piece of clothing. That was his contribution in a very real sense. We see it all over the place today, but I think he originated the idea of the emotional connect to a product or service. So here we have the father of propaganda and spin, Edward Bernays, using an ingenious brainwashing propaganda technique in order to sell a deadly product to a half of the population who had previously been free from the clutches of the tobacco peddlers by a social taboo. The breaking down of that taboo can be traced directly back to Edward Bernays' PR stunt at the Easter Day Parade in New York. And indeed, it was devastatingly effective. That's just one example of the numerous examples of how Edward Bernays used his skill in media manipulation to sell a deadly product to an unsuspecting public. What other examples exist? Well, let's listen to an interview with Christopher Bryson, a former BBC reporter who wrote a book about how that deadly poison, sodium fluoride and stannous fluoride, ended up in our drinking water. A recent Scientific American article about fluoride has only confirmed what scientists and researchers have known about that chemical for decades, namely that it is a poison which may be doing irreparable damage to our bodies including adverse effects on the bones, the brain, the thyroid gland, and, yes, the teeth. What the Scientific American article leaves out is what most people have left out for a long time regarding fluoride, namely three important facts. One, that fluoride was put into the water in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany and the gulags in Russia in order to create a docile worker, as that is one of the effects of this dangerous compound. Two, that sodium fluoride used to be a common ingredient in rat poisons and roach poisons in the United States. And three, that fluoride is in fact a hazardous industrial waste byproduct that is created, among other things, in the production of aluminum, 
and that the first people to heavily influence the debate about fluoridating water was the aluminum industry, which was looking at a way of gaining public acceptance of the growing pollution of fluoride in the water supplies around aluminum factories. Christopher Bryson's book, The Fluoride Deception, reveals these facts and many more about this dangerous compound. But another fact that his book uncovers is the link between Edward Bernays and the fluoride deception. The, the book makes clear for the first time uh, that the selling of fluoride to the American public was done by the, the best in the business, by the father of public relations, Edward Bernays. Uh, Edward Bernays is Sigmund Freud's nephew, and he was a Machiavellian genius, uh, small in size, yet cast a towering shadow over the 20th century. Uh, Bernays understood that there was a liberal sentiment coursing through the 20th century, and that if you could hitch your commercial wagon to, to, to that uh, uh, star, then you could make your clients a lot of money. In 1916, Bernays had suffragettes march in the Easter parade in New York City holding cigarettes as torches of liberty. And uh, he, he, he cooked up that scheme on behalf of the American Tobacco Company and, uh, and, and its director, George Hill, who was paying Bernays' uh, uh, salary. Uh, well, my book uncovers correspondence between Bernays and the National Institutes of Dental Research. Uh, Bernays was asked to come to Washington by the NIDR to help create their PR campaign to sell fluoride to the nation. Bernays understood that people have an unconscious trust in their doctor or their dentist, and if you can persuade doctors and dentists that fluoride is safe and good, then you're, you're, you're uh, able to reach the rest of the nation. People believe they're doctors and dentists, and that was a way of promoting fluoride for Bernays. Now, those two examples obviously put the lie to Anne Bernays' claim earlier in this episode that her father was only interested in the public good and couldn't abide the idea that his brainwashing PR techniques could be used for nefarious purposes. Now, both those examples happen to come from the field of public health, but I can assure my listeners that Edward Bernays had his hand in many other cookie jars, including the political cookie jar. One could only shudder to think about what would be the results of such masterful propaganda being applied in the political sphere, and Joseph Goebbels in Nazi Germany gave us a frightening vision of what that would entail. But it's important to note that even after the Nazi atrocities of World War II, Edward Bernays was an all-too-willing operative for the CIA in selling their operations around the world, including their operation to overthrow the democratically elected government of Guatemala, which they did in the 1950s. For more information on that, let's turn back to another clip from The Century of the Self. One of Bernays's main clients was the giant United Fruit Company. They owned vast banana plantations in Guatemala in Central America. For decades, United Fruit had controlled the country through pliable dictators. It was known as a banana republic. But in 1950, a young officer, Colonel Arbenz, was elected president. He promised to remove United Fruit's control over the country. And in 1953, he announced the government would take over much of their land. It was a massively popular move, but a disaster for United Fruit. And they turned to Bernays to help get rid of Arbenz. United Fruit brings in Bernays, and he basically understood that what United Fruit Company had to do was change this from being a popularly elected government that was doing some things that were good for the people there into this being very close to the American shore, a threat to American democracy, that it being at a time in the Cold War when Americans responded to issues of the Red Scare and what communism might do, he was trying to transform this and brilliantly did transform it into an issue of a communist threat very close to our shores taking United Fruit again as a commercial client out of the picture and making it look like a question of American democracy, American values being threatened. In reality, Arbenz was a democratic socialist with no links to Moscow. But Bernays set out to turn him into a communist threat to America. He organized a trip to Guatemala for influential American journalists. Few of them knew anything about the country or its politics. Bernays arranged for them to be entertained 
and to meet selected Guatemalan politicians who told them that Arbenz was a communist controlled by Moscow. During the trip, there was also a violent anti-American demonstration in the capital. Many of those who worked for United Fruit were convinced it had been organised by Bernays himself. He also created a fake independent news agency in America called the Middle American Information Bureau. It bombarded the American media with press releases saying that Moscow was planning to use Guatemala as a beachhead to attack America. All of this had the desired effect. In Guatemala, the Jacob R. Benz regime became increasingly communistic after its inauguration in 1951. Communists in the Congress and high governmental positions controlled major committees, labor and farm groups, and propaganda facilities. They agitated and led in demonstrations against neighboring countries and the United States. What was profoundly new in terms of what Bernays did is he took this menace to our backyard in Guatemala. For the first time, we saw Reds a couple hundred miles from uh, New Orleans who Eddie Bernays had us believing were a true threat to us, that it was going to be a Soviet outpost in our backyard. But what Bernays was doing was not just trying to blacken the Arbenz regime. He was part of a secret plot. President Eisenhower had agreed that America should topple the Arbenz government, but secretly. The CIA were instructed to organize a coup. Working with the United Fruit Company, the CIA trained and armed a rebel army and found a new leader for the country called Colonel Armas. The CIA agent in charge was Howard Hunt, later one of the Watergate burglars. What we wanted to do was have a terror campaign uh, to terrify our bench particularly, and terrify his, his troops, much as the German Stuka bombers terrified the population of, of uh, Holland, uh, Belgium, and, uh, and Poland at the onset of World War II, and just rendered everybody paralyzed. As planes flown by CIA pilots dropped bombs on Guatemala City, Edward Bernays carried on his propaganda campaign in the American press. He was preparing the American population to see this as the liberation of Guatemala by freedom fighters for democracy. He totally understood that the coup would happen when the public and the press, when conditions in the public and the press allowed for a coup to happen and he created those conditions. He was totally savvy in terms of just what he was helping create there in terms of this overthrow. But ultimately he was reshaping reality, uh, reshaping public opinion in a way that's undemocratic and manipulative. I'd like my listeners to take special note of what they've just heard, as it's not often that a single historical figure can throw the forces that are ranged against freedom and liberty into such stark relief. But think about it. Edward Bernays worked with the White House and the CIA to demonize Arbenz in Guatemala in order to protect the United Fruit Company's interests. The selfsame company that General Smedley Butler fought wars for back in the early part of the 20th century. And regular listeners of the Corbett Report will remember General Smedley Butler from episode 14, in which we learnt that he testified to the McCormick-Dickstein Committee in Congress that he had been recruited for a plot led by wealthy industrialists, including Prescott Bush, grandfather of the current president of the United States, to lead a fascist overthrow of the democratically elected government of the United States of America. And in that documentary clip that we just listened to, we also heard the testimony of E. Howard Hunt, who of course led the CIA operation in Guatemala, which was nicknamed PB Success. E. Howard Hunt, of course, confessed to being part of the plot to assassinate JFK, a plot that also included LBJ, a fact that listeners to episode 21 of the Corbett Report would remember well. And indeed, Edward Bernays's PR techniques, which he helped popularize in the early part of the 20th century, run in an historically integral line from the mid part of the 20th century and his efforts to demonize Guatemala all the way up to today with the current White House administration. Some of those techniques, ham handedly applied by the Bush administration, include this, which was reported on from the Washington Post, March 15, 2005. Headline, Administration Rejects Ruling on PR Videos. Quote, 
The Bush administration, rejecting an opinion from the Government Accountability Office, said last week that it is legal for federal agencies to feed TV stations prepackaged news stories that do not disclose the government's role in producing them. That message, in memo sent Friday to federal agency heads and general counsels, contradicts a February 17th memo from Comptroller General David M. Walker. Walker wrote that such stories, designed to resemble independently reported broadcast news stories so that TV stations can run them without editing, violate provisions in annual appropriations laws that ban covert propaganda. End quote. What that article refers to, of course, is a 2005 scandal regarding the Bush administration buying propaganda time on broadcast news to run stories edited and produced by the White House without proper sourcing so that viewers would think they were actually watching real news. Now that 2005 scandal involved a quarter of a billion dollars being spent by the White House in placing these stories in the network news. And since that time, the practice has continued unabated. Now, ham-handed attempts at placing news stories like that obviously do not hold a candle to the masterful techniques of a genius like Edward Bernays. But they at least show the ready willingness of the current administration to use whatever techniques they can to brainwash the public. And of course, who can forget this scandal from late 2007 regarding the Federal Emergency Management Agency's response to the wildfires which were then raging in California? After faking a news conference, instead of facing the usual grilling from journalists, the Emergency Management Agency had its own employees, you see them sitting down right there, pretend to be reporters and ask the questions. Well, now the White House is responding. It is not um, a, a practice that we would employ here at the White House, or that we, we certainly don't condone it. We didn't know about it beforehand. Uh, FEMA has issued an apology um, and an, saying that they had an error in judgment when they were attempting to try to get out a lot of information to um, reporters who were asking for inf answers to a variety of questions in regards to the wildfires in California. It's not something I would have condoned, and um, they, I'm sure will not do it again. NBC's Jeannie Ohm is live at the White House. Jeannie, FEMA calls it an error in judgment. I understand the Department of Homeland Security says something very different. You're right. Uh, this is a story that is growing ever since it was first published in the Washington Post. The White House said they had just heard about it then. Well, this afternoon, there was a strong response from the Department of Homeland Security, which oversees FEMA. And I want to read part of it. Quote, this is inexcusable and offensive, and stunts like this will not be tolerated or repeated. It was a lapse of judgment, and we find it offensive, and it won't happen again. Laura Keener added that, in fact, the senior leadership is now taking a look at whether FEMA staff will be reprimanded over this incident. And so certainly it's not the kind of press FEMA was looking for. They were really trying to show that they had learned from the mistakes of Hurricane Katrina and were really being proactive, very quick on its feet to respond to the wildfires in California. Instead now, a lot of people talking about this uh, staged news conference earlier in the week. And Jeannie, kind of explain the details. My understanding is, of course, that they called this uh, press conference, you know, very quickly with only 15 minutes to go. And so that didn't give reporters the chance to actually show up. And then I guess there was a call in that reporters could call into with they said no questions. Well, then who was asking the questions at the press conference? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, around here, when you give 15 minutes notice, that's clearly not enough time for any crews to get in position. So the video feed was actually provided by FEMA. So you didn't have reporters getting to the briefing. They did provide an 800 number, but you couldn't even ask questions. So who was asking the questions? It was actually FEMA, FEMA staff, including some people who work in public affairs. A total of six questions were asked. Questions such as, how is FEMA doing? Have they improve from their lesson. So there certainly was no follow-up that you would typically expect uh, once you get a standard response, trying to find out uh, more probing questions, if you will. All right, NBC's Jeannie Ohm, thank you so much. But of course, FEMA is a perfectly respectful organization that deserves our full trust. And you definitely shouldn't go to geopoliticalmonitor.com and look at the background or article about U.S. FEMA camps, because I'm sure they're building these secretive concentration camp-like structures for good purposes only couldn't possibly have anything to do with what would happen in the event of martial law. And again, don't look into InfraGuard and the people who are in the InfraGuard system telling reporters that they've been given orders to shoot to kill in the event of the implementation of martial law, because none of that information is important. All kidding aside, I hope what this episode has illustrated is that people in positions of power have been polishing their PR techniques over the last century, 
making sure they're just right so that we can be easily enough manipulated that we'll go along with anything, even the implementation of martial law. The case of Edward Bernays is an instructive one, and there are other examples out there. Please let us know about your research into this topic by going to the CorbettReport.com blog and leaving some details about your research in the comment section under the episode 33 blog entry. In closing, I'd just like my listeners to reflect on Edward Bernays' comments that there is a secret elite ruling the masses by manipulating their opinions without them even knowing about it. And to ask yourself if you would trust Anne Bernays in her assessment that her father was only interested in the public good. Perhaps we'll leave the final word in this episode to Anne Bernays. Let's listen to what she said about her father in a different interview in a particularly candid moment. Thank you again for joining me. And join me again next week for another edition of the Corbett Report. He knows everybody. He knows the mayor and he knows the senator and he calls politicians on the telephone. As if he did get a, 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 literally a, a high or a bang out of doing what he did. And that's fine, but it, it can be a little hard on the people around you, especially when you make other people feel stupid. People who worked for him were stupid, and children were stupid, and if people did things in a way that he didn't, that he wouldn't have done them, they were stupid. That was a, it was a word that he used over and over and over, dope and stupid. And the masses? They were stupid. The Corbett Report is brought to you by the Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.